שלום to everyone, okay. it's wonderful to see all of you here, thank you for coming. Uh, I will start with a few words in Hebrew, but the whole event will be in English. So, uh, שלום לכולם, אני שמח לקבל את פניכם כאן בהרצאה מיוחדת uh, מחזית הפיזיקה התיאורטית בחסות מכון רקח לפיזיקה uh, והכנס הבינלאומי מיתרים 2017 שיתחיל מחר בתל אביב. שמי ברק קול ואני חוקר בתחום חוקי הטבע היסודיים, פרופסור לפיזיקה וראש החוג לפיזיקה כאן באוניברסיטה העברית, וההרצאה והאירוע כולו יהיו באנגלית. So, uh, thank you for coming and welcome to a special public lecture from the frontier of theoretical physics sponsored by the Rakach Institute of Physics and by the Strings 2017 conference which will begin tomorrow in Tel Aviv. My name is Barak Kol, I'm a researcher of the fundamental laws of nature and the professor of physics and the head of physics studies here at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and I wish us all a pleasant and stimulating evening. Before the scientific talk, we shall follow local tradition and listen to a musical overture which would hopefully set us in a positive and energetic mood. We shall hear a movement from a string quartet by Dvozhak the first movement from the American String Quartet. The quartet was written in summer 1893 in Iowa. The composer was 51 years old and had just begun a four month long vacation from his post as the director of the National Conservatory in New York City. This was his second composition since he arrived to the US. The first one is very famous. It's the symphony from the New World but that, that had not been played at, at, yet at this point. In Iowa, surrounded by beautiful nature and a community of Czech compatriots, he felt in good spirits, worked hard, and completed the composition quickly in a little over two weeks. The name American describes the place of writing, but not the music itself, which is actually full of Slavic elements from Dvozhak's home country. According to Wikipedia, the American Quartet proved a turning point in the Vojak's chamber music output. For decades, he had toiled unsuccessfully to find a balance between his overflowing me melodic invention and a clear structure. In the American Quartet, this, final, this was finally achieved. To date, it is one of the most popular pieces in chamber music repertoire, and I'm sure we shall enjoy it. The players this evening are outstanding students at the Jerusalem Academy of Music and Dance, uh, who recently won the first prize in an academy contest. They are Noah Sarid in the violin, Chava Frankel violin, uh, Yaakov Geller viola, and William Weil cello. Please join me in a warm welcome to them.
fantastic. So, Noah Sarid, Chava Frenkel, Yaakov Geller, and William Weil. And now... Uh, and now we turn to our main event, the lecture. Uh, this evening we are fortunate to have as our speaker Professor Steven Schenker from Stanford University, the former director of the Stanford Institute for Theoretical Physics. Professor Schenker, born in 1953, obtained his Bachelor of Science degree from Harvard University. And in 1980, his Doctor of Philosophy degree from Cornell University. He was faculty at the University of Chicago starting in 1981 then a professor at Rutgers University starting in 1989. In 1998, he became the director of the Stanford Institute for Theoretical Physics, with which he is affiliated till this day. Professor Schenker has been working in the last four decades on theories of fundamental interactions, mostly on string theory and uh, related topics such as quantum gravity, qu uh, condensed matter physics, quantum field theory. In the 80s, he made numerous fundamental contributions to the study of two-dimensional field theories, many together with Dan Friedan. This work related to string theory since in space-time, the string traces a two-dimensional uh, world sheet as time unfolds. In the 90s, he worked on several non-perturbative aspects of string theory, and in particular, he presented pioneering evidence for such effects later to be realized by the discovery of the so-called D-brains, which constitute a key element in string theory dynamics. Since then, he has worked on several problems in quantum gravity, including cosmology, black holes, singularity, a novel connection between the theory of chaos and black holes, which is the subject of the talk today. Okay, so this sounds like a lot of physics. The work of Professor Schenker was recognized by several awards, and I will mention some of them. In 1987, he was awarded the MacArthur Fellowship, also known as the Genius Grant. The grant supports creative American individuals in diverse fields of arts, science, and more. Today, it distributes some two dozen awards per year, each in an amount of over $600,000. Uh, fellows are completely free to use the grant as they see fit. He won teaching prizes both at Rutgers and at Stanford. In 2010, he won the Lars Onsager Prize from the American Physical Society uh, for work in statistical physics. And in 2015, he was elected member of the American National Academy of Science. On a personal note, I met Steve over 20 years ago when I was a PhD student at Stanford, including a period of several months when he stayed at Stanford during my last year uh, over there. Steve is known to be rather selective in the works that he publishes and to retain a steady and very high level of quality. In this sense, I admire him as a yardstick of quality. It is an honor and privilege for me to welcome him to present a talk titled Chaos, Quantum Mechanics, and Black Holes. Well, I'm happy to be here. And, uh... It's a pleasure for me to see all of you in this audience. You can decide later whether it's a pleasure for you to see me. But go. As I promised, I'm going to tell you about three different areas of physics that, at first glance, seem quite different. Chaos, quantum mechanics, and black holes. And I hope to convince you that, in fact, there are deep relationships between these subjects. Further, if I'm lucky, I'm going to convince you that the relationships we talk about actually shed new light on each of these individual areas. So to tell a story like this, we have to start somewhere. So let's start by talking about chaos. Actually, we're going to start further back. We're going to talk about uh, what chaos contrasts with, which is the Newtonian view of the world. Our first real view of quantitative science went like this. You imagine starting with an initial configuration, for instance, the sun at rest, more or less, and the earth here, give them an initial positions and velocities, and then let them evolve in time according to the equations of motion, in this case, Newton's equations. And we know what happens. The earth moves smoothly around the sun. The future is easily predictable. After a year, the earth comes back to exactly where it was before, almost exactly. 
Now, if you perturb the Earth a little bit, oh, it comes back maybe a little later or a little earlier. But it basically moves in a very regular, predictable way. I have to tell you that this is not typical, even in classical mechanics. It's usually very hard to predict the future. I think all of you have had certain experiences along these lines. Here's an example from physics about how hard it is. This is playing pool. I actually don't know. Do people play pool in Israel? Do you play billiards? You know what this is. You've seen them. All right. So if you're a skillful pool player, you can start the cue ball, break these balls apart, and it's extremely difficult to know where exactly they will all go. It's hard to be a good pool player. And the reason it's hard is chaos. The phrase that goes along with this is sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So here's some diagram I stole from some old physics book that you would use to analyze the collision of two billiard balls. Here's the incoming billiard ball. Here's a target at rest. Notice that this incoming one is displaced a little bit from the center line by what we call an impact parameter. The fact that this ball is a little bit lower means after a while it will move all the way to the bottom of the screen. This one centimeter displacement means after a while there's a couple of meters of displacement. On the other hand, if you took this uh, incoming uh, cue ball and moved it up a little bit, it would come over and then move to the top of the screen. A tiny, like, one centimeter change gets amplified into many meters after a little while. Where you are at the end is sensitively dependent on where you start. That's why it's hard to be a good pool player. It's not the only reason it's hard. But one of the reasons is you have to be very accurate in how you start the balls rolling. The sensitive dependence on initial conditions is the hallmark of what we'll call strong chaos. The weather. The weather is what people always talk about with chaos. It's, in fact, a very complicated system. But roughly speaking, the same sensitive dependence on initial conditions underlies how difficult it is to make uh, predictions far in the future about the weather. We don't know the current temperature or wind speeds all over the world to exquisite accuracy. We know them pretty well. But because the equations of weather are very unstable, like this kind of mechanical instability, Small errors get magnified, and after five or 10 days, those small errors magnify so much that you really cannot reliably predict the weather. There's another phrase I should tell you about. Sometimes this sensitive dependence on initial conditions is called the butterfly effect. A butterfly flapping its wings in, let's say, London might cause five days later for there to be a thunderstorm in New York, or if the butterfly flapped its wings an hour later, maybe there would be a hurricane in South Carolina. Little tiny changes get magnified by the instabilities of these systems and cause dramatic changes. And it's very important to realize that this is a fundamental source of uncertainty in the world, even without quantum mechanics and uncertainty principles. There's no way we can ever know the initial conditions exactly. And since many of the equations in, in nature are chaotic, there's an intrinsic limit to how well we can know the future. Well, chaos isn't all bad. It leads to simplicity. Imagine this uh, box of atoms colliding just according to the rules of classical mechanics. It turns out that chaos causes these atoms to spread out uniformly. If you start with all the atoms up in this upper right-hand corner, they'll bang around and they basically will get as far away from each other as they can. That's the typical thing for chaos to do. The energy becomes uniformly shared. If one of these atoms had a lot more energy than the other, the repeated chaotic collisions would distribute the energy among the other atoms. We call this kind of uniformity of rapidly colliding chaotic motion thermal behavior. And this uniformity is what we call thermal equilibrium. So it's a really important lesson I want you to take away. Oh, I forgot to tell you. This kinetic energy that gets distributed is the measure of temperature in thermal systems. Every particle has kinetic energy three halves times the temperature multiplied by this constant called Boltzmann's constant. And so this lesson that I want you to take away that I got interrupted about is that thermal behavior 
is a consequence of chaos. When you're in your hot shower, when you're drinking your hot cup of tea, those things, you're, you're imbibing chaos. Okay? It's part of everyday life, and, it, and, it, and it's crucial. Well, as scientists, we want to quantify these things. We want to quantify how sensitive things are to initial conditions. Here's a simple model that will help us do that. Imagine that you have a particle not in one of these three-dimensional boxes, but just in a one-dimensional box. Running from zero to one, the coordinate of that particle we'll call x. And let's make things really easy for us. Let's imagine that time is discrete. Zero, one, two. And let's make a really simple dynamical rule for how things change in time. The dynamical rule is that after one time step, the position is twice the position at the previous time step. But if we multiply this by two, we'll get out of the box. The rule is if you get out of the box, you come back in the other side. That's what this mod one means. So this is the rule. It's amazingly simple. It actually is, is a very interesting rule. It's called in mathematics a Bernoulli shift. But it's one of the simplest examples of chaos. So there's the dynamical rule. It's easiest to understand if you write things out in binary. Okay, that's x written out in binary. It's one plus times a half plus one times a quarter plus zero times an eighth, one times a sixteenth. And that's a binary point, but I'll probably call it a decimal point because I can never remember to call it a binary point. When you multiply something by two, you just shift the binary point. So the dynamical rule is shift the binary point, and then mod one means leave off everything to the left of the binary point. So shift and truncate. That's the dynamical rule. So here's an example of the time course of, that, of this thing. We start over here, so half plus a quarter, it's about three quarters. We do this, we got to something like near a half. We then go all the way, almost to zero, and then back to a half again. So there's this kind of crazy motion that reads out the binary string of the initial state. Now consider two nearby particles, one of them with this coordinate and one of them with that coordinate. They're pretty close by because they agree, I guess, to one part in 16, maybe. Their difference we'll call delta x, and this is a picture of them very close together. And now let's watch what happens when they evolve in time. Well, here's a table. Here's one of them, here's the other. This is after one time step, we shift and truncate, shift and truncate. And you see that even though they started out almost the same after these three steps, one starts with zero and one starts with one. They're about as far apart as you can get in this box. So things that are close together, their distance gets amplified in a rule like this. This is the sensitive dependence on initial conditions. A tiny change in initial condition gets magnified. I think that's what I just said. So here's the dynamical rule, and we can ask what happens to this difference. Well, the difference at time zero turns into twice when you go to time one. At time t, whoops, I, um, you go two to the t times the initial difference. Let's write that as e to the log two times t. And so the difference gets exponentially magnified. We often call that amount of exponential magnification, we give it a name, lambda sub L. Here, lambda sub L is log 2. And that lambda sub L is what we call a Lyapunov exponent. And it characterizes the strength of chaos. Here at each step, we spread apart by a factor of 2. I could have spread apart by a factor of three, and then the Lyapunov exponent would be log three, or 17, and it would be log 17. That number is a quantitative measure of how chaotic the system is. Okay, and we're gonna be interested in numbers like that. Well, again, chaos leads to simplicity. You can start at this point, and then evolve a large number of steps. Bang, 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 bang. And if you start at a generic point, eventually the density of points in the box will be uniform. I'll leave you as an exercise to figure out what kind of non-generic points you can start with where this doesn't happen. Okay. There are very few of them. 
And, but typically, this is what happens. So again, the system has reached equilibrium in this toy. Well, there's another concept we need called entropy. Sometimes you have a finite set of allowed configurations. The particle can't be anywhere in the box, but maybe you just allow a finite number of bits in its position. Like in my iPhone, there's 64 bits in a word. Okay, so maybe you expand this out, just have 64 ones and zeros. We call, well, the number of possible configurations is 2 to the n. If you have two bits, it's two squared, it's four possible configurations. We define the entropy S as the logarithm of the number of allowed configurations. So for in the iPhone word, I guess it's not in my pocket, in my knapsack, the entropy is 64 log 2. Entropy plays a central role in thermal systems. I'm sure you've heard about it. And it becomes a maximum in equilibrium. Okay, well, that's enough about classical physics and classical chaos. We're moving along very well now. Okay. We now have to turn to quantum mechanics, and I guess I have to teach you quantum mechanics. A little bit, at least. Okay. All right, the simplest classical configuration you can think of is a single bit that can be zero or one, one piece of this iPhone word of mine. In quantum mechanics, you promote this to a quantum bit called a qubit. It's described by two states, again, zero and one, with this decoration around them. Okay. But the general state of a quantum bit is not a zero or a one. It's a linear combination of zero and one. Alpha and beta turn out to be complex numbers. And in that general state, if you measure the qubit, it will give you either zero or one in some random mixture, the probabilities being determined by these coefficients. A qubit is not either zero or one. In some sense, it's zero and one. Okay. So it's a much more complicated and interesting object. The way to think about it is you think of psi as a vector. Think of this zero piece as like the x unit vector and the one piece as a y unit vector. And this is some superposition of x vector and y vector. That blue arrow is an example of psi. Here I forgot about these being complex numbers, just treated them as real numbers. Usually we demand that these vectors be unit length so they live on this circle. The space, the space where quantum states live is called Hilbert space. And it's the arena for quantum mechanics to act. Imagine you have two classical bits. Well, they can have four configurations, these four. In quantum mechanics, two qubits would have these four basis states, but this, the full state could be a linear combination of all four of these things. So you go from having four configurations to living in a four-dimensional space, too big a space for me to draw. Well, suppose you have n qubits, like the 64 in my iPhone. Then you have two to the nth of these basis states in a two to the nth dimensional Hilbert space. For my 64 bits in my iPhone, 2 to the 64th is about 10 to the 19th dimensions. So a quantum version of the word in my iPhone lives in a 10 to the 19th dimensional space, which is a very large dimensional space. The slogan that goes along with this is that Hilbert space is a big place. Okay. And the more you think about it, the more you appreciate the truth of this statement. All right, so there's the formula again. The dimension of the Hilbert space for n qubits is 2 to the n. So instead of one 64-bit word that I have to store to keep track of things in my iPhone, I need 2 to the 64 or 10 to the 19th complex numbers to tell me what that vector is. 10 to the 19th, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, aleph, base, gamma, you, you know. right. That's 10 to the 11th gigabytes, or about the memory of, or in 10 to the 5th supercomputer. So to store one 64-qubit state in classical computers, you need an enormous amount of classical uh, resources. You gain something, though, from this complexity. Here's an example of a quantum state with three qubits. 
Suppose for some reason you wanted to do something on these classical bit strings. You wanted, for instance, to see if they were the key for some code that you were given. You wanted to see if this was the key that unlocked some message, like your friend's bank account or something like that. Okay. Normally what you would have to do is you'd have to try each of these sequentially and see if they were the key. If you were able to operate on the state, there's a way in which you could operate on all these bit strings at the same time because the state is made up out of all of them. This is called quantum parallelism, and it underlies the speed up in what's called quantum computation. I'm sure you've all heard about the possibility of having quantum computers. This is one of the things you get from this enormous proliferation of resources, this enormous size of Hilbert space. You get to do a lot of things at the same time. And in fact, this is another connection between fields that I didn't even put in my title or my abstract. This idea of quantum computation and what's more generally what's called quantum information theory underlies a lot of the developments that I'm going to talk about. And it's been a really fruitful link between quantum gravity and chaos and many body physics in recent years. And these are two of the groups that, that were instrumental in, in making this link and this quantum chaos story that I'm going to tell. All right, so I've given you the arena in which quantum mechanics acts. It's Hilbert space. What is the law of motion? What's the analog of Newton's laws? Well, it's nothing so complicated as all that. All that happens is that a state, a vector, just rotates. Well, quantum mechanics is pretty complicated, obviously. We're all running quantum mechanical uh, operations in our head. A lot of complicated thoughts are going on. Well, I hope they are. Okay. How can a simple rotation duplicate that complicated setup? Well, the reason, again, is the size of Hilbert space. In D equals 3, you can rotate around the xy, the xz, and the yz plane. There are three angles that you have to specify to specify a rotation. If D was very large, like the size of Hilbert space, you'd have D squared angles, all different pairs. So if you had n qubits, you have 2 to the 2 n angles. So in my 64 qubit quantum iPhone, I'd have 2 to the 128th angles, or 10 to the 38th angles. You can make a very complicated rotation with that many angles. So even though dynamics, time evolution is simple, it's a rotation, you can have very, very complicated rotations in these high dimensional spaces. That's why things can seem complicated in the world. So now we can start talking about what is the quantum version of sensitivity to initial conditions, this hallmark of chaos I talked about. Well, the first idea it's that everybody thinks about, including me, is you mimic the classical definition very closely. You start out with two states close together in Hilbert space. The red and the blue arrow are close together. Okay? And then evolve them in time and see if they separate. But they're not going to separate. Evolving in time means a rotation, and the hallmark of a rotation is it doesn't change the distance between vectors. So that's not what chaos is. So we have to think more deeply about what it means to be quantum chaotic. And in fact, as I just said that, the general framework for this has only recently been understood in the past half a dozen years or so, even though inklings about what to do were around since the 1960s. So I'll try to give you uh, a bit of the idea about how you diagnose quantum chaos, quantum, the quantum butterfly effect, say. Here's the classical analog of what you need to do. Imagine you classically evolve forward in time. There's a blue line with a blue arrow here. And then stop and turn the movie backward. Reverse the velocities and let the trajectories unwind exactly in reverse, and you get back to where you started. But now suppose you evolve forward, the blue line, and then you apply a small perturbation. You kick one of the billiard balls just a little bit, and then you run the movie backward. Well, if the system is chaotic, it traces quite a different trajectory. And the longer you go forward and the longer you go back, the bigger the difference is in this beginning point and the end point. This is the hallmark of chaos. 
that this small perturbation causes you to rapidly make a big mistake in retracing your steps. Chaos causes the separation to grow exponentially in time, and again, the exponent is determined by this Lyapunov exponent. This we can do in quantum mechanics. We evolve forward in time. That means we rotate, let's say, by 30 degrees around some angle, and then rotate back by 30 degrees. You end up with no rotation at all. You're back where you started. But now suppose you evolve forward, rotate, and now do another perturbation. Flip one qubit. That's a little tiny rotation, actually. That's like that green perturbation that I drew. Is it on the here? Yeah. So this is evolving forward. You rotate by 30 degrees. Flip one qubit. That's a tiny little rotation. And then evolve back. You don't get back to the same no rotation state. You get back to a very different complicated rotation. In a chaotic system, the net effect is a complicated rotation, not an almost cancellation. And you measure how complicated this rotation is by how likely it is to flip not this qubit that I flipped, but one 100 qubits over. How likely it is to flip that one. That gives you a diagnostic of chaos. And that likelihood grows exponentially in time, defining a quantum Lyapunov exponent. So again, we evolve forward, make a simple perturbation, and then evolve back See how badly you fail in coming back to where you start. That's the quantum diagnostic of chaos that we'll use. This thing was, has only really been studied in general in the last, I guess, four years now, and it's called an out-of-time order correlator. You don't have to remember that or know anything about it. It's jargon. One good thing about it is it is computable in a wide variety of contexts. We'll talk about one of them. Well, we're done with chaos and classical physics. Now we get to talk about black holes. Okay. I'm going pretty fast. Maybe we'll have to end early. Okay. Um, black holes, as you all know, are a profound consequence of general relativity. Here's an artist's conception of a black hole against a star field. As you can see, the name is accurate. It's black. Any light coming from behind it is absorbed by the black hole. And in fact, there's a spherical surface surrounding the black hole, and if anything enters that surface, it can never escape. Here's a lousy diagram of that. This is the spherical surface. It's called a horizon or an event horizon. And once you fall inside that event horizon, no matter how much energy you expand, how powerful your rockets, you can never escape. Your future is fixed forever. You fall inexorably toward a region of extremely high tidal forces called the singularity, where anything we know about is ripped to shreds. So it's a good thing to avoid. Okay. Sometimes it's called the singularity. Again, this picture is particularly deceptive, but it's hard to draw good pictures of black holes. Okay. Now, if you stay just outside the horizon, you can sort of linger there if you exert enormous energy to avoid the tendency to fall into the black hole. So by exerting enormous energy, you can hover here for a long time and finally peel away. That will be important to us later. Well, now we can combine quantum mechanics and black holes, make one of these connections. And these connections were really explored in depth for the first time in the 1970s. It turns out that black holes are not black when you add quantum mechanics. In fact, they act like thermal systems. They radiate thermal radiation like a hot piece of coal. One of the first, uh, probably the first thermal thing that people learned about black holes is they have entropy. And this was a discovery of Jacob Bekenstein, a much loved member of your faculty who passed away recently. He argued that black holes have an entropy and the formula he proposed was remarkable and, and remarkably deep and remarkably simple. He said, take this funny surface called the horizon and divide it into little pixels. Here are their triangles. Make sure each pixel has a certain amount of area. There's a basic length when you study quantum mechanics and gravity called the Planck length. 
It's about 10 to the minus 33rd centimeters. Carve up your horizon into little pixels of that size. Count the number of pixels. That's the horizon area divided by this Planck area, and then divide by four. That's the entropy of a black hole. That's that formula again. It's an enormous entropy. For a solar mass black hole, the radius of that horizon sphere is about three kilometers. The entropy is about 10 to the 78th bits. I didn't work out what that was in supercomputers. It's really, really a lot. Okay? It's, it's a huge entropy. But in some sense, the entropy is very small. One thing you know if you buy computers, especially lots of computers, is that they stack up and they fill up a volume. So if I bought lots of computers, I would have a volume's worth of computers in this room. The number of disk drives is proportional to the volume of the room. But here, the entropy is proportional only to the area of the black hole, not the volume. In some sense, that's much less entropy than you expect, even though the area is carved up into tiny pieces, so there's a lot of entropy. This is an indication of what's called the holographic principle that I'll discuss a little more later. Well, quantum black holes are thermal systems, and the real smoking gun for this was the discovery that they have a temperature, the Hawking temperature, T, and they emit this thermal radiation that you're used to from seeing from hot objects called Hawking radiation. And the temperature that Hawking derived is consistent with the entropy Bekenstein found. It turns out when you think about thermodynamics, the change of entropy with energy tells you something about the temperature of a system. And in fact, this relation pinned down this factor of a quarter. But now we're back to the beginning. Chaos underlies thermal behavior in ordinary systems. You remember your hot shower. Okay. Black holes are thermal. That suggests that black holes are chaotic as well, quantum black holes at least. And in fact, this turns out to be the case. In fact, they are the most chaotic systems in nature. And this is what I'll try to tell you in the, in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Let's make precise this statement. Well, we have this diagnostic for quantum chaos. We should apply it to the black hole. The problem is that that diagnostic was set up to work in ordinary quantum mechanical systems, not things like black holes that have quantum mechanics and gravity both. Those are too complicated to deal with. So one is not really sure what to do except for a remarkable discovery that was made actually 20 years ago this year called gauge gravity duality. The general framework was discovered by Juan Maldacena. And what this principle says is that there is a precise mapping between a, an ordinary quantum mechanical system, a pretty special ordinary quantum mechanical system, and a quantum system that includes gravity. That means if you know something about ordinary quantum mechanics, you know something about quantum gravity. There's a this duality, as it's called, provides a dictionary between ordinary quantum mechanical systems of this special type and gravitational quantum systems. So then we're set up to translate the chaos diagnostic in the ordinary quantum mechanical system to a quantity in the quantum gravitational one. All right, so now I'll try to tell you a little bit about how that works. Here's a better picture of gauge gravity duality. Imagine you have a piece of space. This gray shell is the boundary of space. Space is three-dimensional. The shell is two-dimensional. The ordinary quantum system lives on the boundary. It lives on this gray shell. We'll call it the boundary theory. Quantum gravity lives inside the shell, in the, in the bulk of this thing, in the three-dimensional bulk. We'll call it the bulk theory. The boundary here lives in d dimensions. Here d is 2. We have a two-dimensional ordinary quantum system and a three-dimensional quantum gravity system. This is peculiar. 
It says if we have an area's worth of degrees of freedom of ordinary quantum mechanics, it's enough to describe a volume's worth of quantum gravity. That's the way holograms work, okay? A, a two-dimensional plane can make an image in three dimensions. And in fact, this is a concrete example of the holographic principle. This turns out to be amazing, but it's true. It is amazing, but it turns out to be true. That all you need is an area's worth of degrees of freedom to describe a volume's worth of quantum gravity. And this is motivated by Bekenstein's idea that the entropy is proportional to area, not volume. So finally, we can talk about the elephant in the room, this black hole in the center. Suppose the boundary theory is at finite temperature. You heat up whatever this quantum system is. These little tadpoles here are supposed to represent hot quanta running around in this boundary theory. By the dictionary, that must correspond in the bulk to some kind of finite temperature gravity thing. Well, the only finite temperature gravity things we know are black holes with Hawking temperature T. So the dictionary says this hot soup of ordinary quantum stuff corresponds exactly to a quantum black hole with temperature T. And so we can study black holes by studying these special finite temperature boundary quantum systems. And we can also go backwards. If you know something about black holes, we can learn something about these finite temperature systems. So now we have this setup. We can use the quantum diagnostic of chaos in the thermal boundary theory. Run forward, perturb, run back. Evolve forward, perturb, evolve back. That's what I said. Okay. And then we can use the dictionary to translate to the bulk black hole dynamics. And the result of it, I'm not going to explain the details, is what's written in blue. Strong chaos in the boundary theory corresponds in the bulk theory to a high energy gravitational collision near the black hole horizon. What's colliding? Well, there are bulk particles that are dual to the boundary theory excitations. How strong are collisions that are mediated by gravity? Well, this is a formula you might recognize. It's the Newton's force due to gravity. It's G Newton, gra Newton's constant, mass of one particle, mass of two particle, second particle, divided by the distance squared. Here's another equation you recognize that says that mass and energy act very much the same. So the collision strength is proportional to G Newton times the energy of one particle times the energy of another particle. Gravitational collisions grow very rapidly in strength with energy. That's part of the reason they're so hard to study. Whoops. Grows rapidly with energy. How high is the energy? Well, here we come back to this picture of the horizon that I talked about. We're interested in a bulk particle that starts very near the horizon. We don't want it to fall in. We want it to skim the horizon. And after a time t, we want the particle to break away and travel near the boundary, where it has a characteristic energy given by the Hawking temperature of the black hole. But to do this, to hover near the horizon for a long time, it had to start with exponentially high energy. e to this funny set of constants times time multiplied by the Hawking energy. So it starts with a very high energy. The later you want this thing to break away, the higher the energy it had to start with. And it's going to collide with a low energy particle with ordinary energy. So the collision strength is the product of these two energies. It's kT squared times this exponential factor. So the collision strength goes exponentially with the time at which this particle breaks away. Now let me try to connect this to the chaos diagnostic. Think of this blue line, just classically, being the particle hanging near the horizon and eventually breaking away. Think of this perturbation as being the low energy particle hitting it. 
But because the collision is such high energy, it drastically changes the future course of the particle it collided with. And so there's a big difference between here and here. You'll remember the last time I showed you this picture, I was running forward in time and then running back. A collision, everything runs forward in time. This is a subtlety. This is because time and black hole is a funny thing. What you, what you thought was time outside the horizon, if you fall into the horizon, it really turns into space and vice versa. That you have to keep track of to get the story straight. That's one of the subtleties I'm going to have to push by you. Okay. So again, that, this, one, this is just what I said. So the collision strength is this. This is dual to our chaos diagnostic. It grows exponentially in time with a Lyapunov exponent. But now we can read off the Lyapunov exponent by saying this is the same as this. The Lyapunov exponent is given by that collection of symbols, temperature divided by h-bar, the, the Planck's constant. Black holes turn out to be strongly chaotic. At high temperatures, this Lyapunov exponent is huge. Now, black holes push physical limits in many ways. No matter, no matter can be denser. If you try to squeeze ordinary matter, eventually gravitational forces cause it to implode into a black hole. That's as dense as you can ever make matter. Information can't be stored more compactly. You imagine collapsing your disk drives and eventually they turn into a black hole. And all you can do is store the information on the surface of the horizon, the way Bekenstein taught us. And it turns out that no system is more chaotic. The Lyapunov exponent in any physical system, subject to certain constraints that I won't get into, is less than or equal to this black hole value. There's a bound on chaos, a bound on quantum chaos. I haven't been giving many references, but I can't resist here. This is work with Juan Maldacena and my brilliant young collaborator, Douglas Stanford, who a lot of this work was done in collaboration with him. Well, I can't explain the argument for this bound, but what I can do, tell you is why this is a reasonable set of quantities to describe such a bound. It's the uncertainty principle, the quantum mechanical uncertainty principle that I'm sure many of you have heard about. Suppose you want to measure a very small time interval, delta t. Well, then you need a very large spread in energies to be able to measure that. Small time interval, large spread in energies. They must, the product must be greater than h bar. But the Lyapunov exponent is a rate, an inverse time. To measure a really big Lyapunov exponent, you have to measure a very short time over which things change. The largest energy available, and hence the energy spread in a typical thermal system, is given by KT. So the shortest resolvable time in a thermal quantum system is h-bar over KT. So inverting that, The biggest Lyapunov exponent you can find is kt over h-bar. The 2 pi takes substantially more work. But this is roughly the ballpark for what a bound should look like. Now classically, h-bar goes to zero. So in classical physics, there is no bound. In fact, you can easily build classical systems that are as chaotic as you want. It's only in quantum mechanics where there's a bound because that's the only place where you have an uncertainty principle that makes it very costly to measure very short times. Okay, well now let me spend a second talking about sociology. Well, the last 10 minutes or so, I've gone through a set of uh, arguments that have really shown how quantum gravity has something to give to the field of quantum chaos. It provided this nice bound on how quantum chaotic something could be, how sensitive to initial conditions a quantum system could be. 
Well, but in any kind of relationship, human relationships, relationships between subjects, it's nice if the relationship is sort of equal, if there's equal giving on both sides. I think all of us know how sometimes that doesn't work, but uh, it's often a good thing. And so a question you can ask, is there some way for some mutuality to get reestablished? Is there some way that quantum chaos can teach us something about quantum gravity? And we think the answer is yes. And here I'm going to talk about the work that I'm currently engaged in, that I, I actually, in 16 hours, I'll, I'll agonize about this with my colleagues at the big annual strings conference in Tel Aviv that starts tomorrow morning. And I think I talked literally in 16 hours about it. So I, I can't resist telling you a little bit about what I'm going to tell them. Quantum mechanical systems, at least if they're contained in a box, like these black holes, have discrete energy levels. You've seen pictures about the spectrum of the hydrogen atom or other situations like that. They're quantized, they're discrete, that's why it's quantum mechanics. And so you can ask, if you have a chaotic system, what do its energy levels look like? It turns out they have a, a characteristic pattern. Here's a pattern of energy levels from a non-chaotic system. Some of them are very close together, some of them are far apart. This, the spacings are kind of, have no special structure to them. But if you have a quantum chaotic system, the levels have a very special structure. Here's a really good quantum chaotic system. You can see that it's very hard for levels to be close together. They like to be more or less evenly spaced. If you think about it as some kind of crystal, they have a rigidity. It's hard to squeeze the crystal locally, and it, it, it kind of has, it has what's called spectral rigidity. And it turns out, more than that, the spectrum you get of a quantum system, for the, here I'll uh, appeal to a little bit of knowledge, probably at least half of you have, the way you find the energy levels of a quantum system is you diagonalize a matrix called the Hamiltonian matrix. The pattern of energy levels in quantum chaotic systems is if you replace the Hamiltonian matrix by a random matrix, where every entry in the matrix is just a random number. And such a random matrix has just this kind of pattern. In fact, these little words here are about different kinds of random matrices. I cheated a little bit. I think these are just random matrix spectra, not real chaotic system spectra. And so that suggests the following. Black holes are quantum chaotic systems. Do they display spectral rigidity? Do they display random matrix behavior? Well, it's very hard to study with known examples of gauge gravity duality. This quantum system that was plated on the boundary of space, it's impossible to know what its energy levels are. That takes a level of understanding far greater than what we have. But recently, a very simple toy model of a quantum black hole has been found. It's called the sach devier kateyev model. It originally was studied in condensed matter physics in the 1990s as a model of what are called strange metals. These are things related to high temperature superconductors. It has some aspects of a quantum black hole if you use this gauge gravity duality correspondence. And it can serve as a toy model. Here's what it's like. You take n qubits. They're really a special kind of qubit called a Majorana fermion, but never mind. Just think of one of these qubits we were talking about. And take all pairs of them and couple them together with a random interaction, positive, negative, draw random interactions. Really, in the real model, you take groups of four and couple them, but it doesn't matter. Kitaev recently showed that a variant of this model saturates the chaos bound. It is chaotic as any system in the world, including a black hole. So it suggests it may serve as a toy model of a black hole. I think I repeated this, didn't I? So one thing we can try to do is we can try to study this toy system and see if it displays spectral rigidity. Now, the Hilbert space has dimension 2 to the n, as I explained to you. Turns out, using our 
feeble classical computers, we can study n equals 17, 128,000 dimensional Hilbert space. And we can diagonalize matrices this big. We can do computer experiments on quantum black holes, at least baby ones. We really would like to have a quantum computer to do this, but we don't, so we do what we can. So a large group of us began studying this toy model to try to understand if it had some of these aspects of quantum chaos. There's a very large list of authors, even if you abbreviate by last names, it's long. Let me point out that one of them is Guy Gurari, who is a student at uh, Weizmann Institute, now a postdoc with us at Stanford. He'll be a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Studies starting in the fall. He really was central in all of this work. I should also say that the work I'm discussing was motivated by important earlier work by one of our own, Eliezer Rabinovici. Well, how do you diagnose spectral rigidity? What you do is you study the pair correlation function. Give it an energy at E, how likely it is, is it to have an energy at E prime? Then you Fourier transform with respect to the energy difference and get some function, G of T. Here's if you have a random matrix. There's an interesting original part. Then there's a ramp and a plateau. That ramp and plateau structure is diagnostic of spectral rigidity. And here, here is this Sachdevier-Kitaev model after spending 1,000 hours of computing time diagonalizing these big matrices. Sure enough, there's something early, but then there's this ramp and plateau. This baby model of a black hole has spectral rigidity. And we conjecture that this is a general pattern in quantum black holes. The real question is, what does this mean for quantum gravity? Now that we have evidence that it's there in quantum black holes. Well, unfortunately, the answer to this question that I can give you is a very short one. We don't know. And this is what I'll agonize with my colleagues about in 16 hours. But I think now maybe it's time to, to wind up. And I can say in this context that one of the real rewards for me to give talks like this is, to hope, is the hope that I can persuade some of you to join us in trying to figure out puzzles like this and try to push back the, the, the edge of what we understand a little further. So thank you. Do. You show the simulation done on our regular computer, so an exponentially hard. Can one do such a, like a manual block type, analog quantum computer simulation of the, the same source? But on yeah, that's, people are trying to do, are trying to measure the uh, Lyapunov exponent in that way. Whether one will be able to study these very long time uh, features, this Fourier transform, is less clear to me. You'd have to be able, the Fourier transform to see the fine energy differences involves going to long time. And that involves keeping the system coherent for a very long time. I'm not sure if that's possible. But certain aspects, like computing this Lyapunov exponent, is, at rapid, is actively under investigation. More questions? Yes. 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 Is this point to figure at the classical quantization of time if the smallest value that you can measure? Well, here the, the, the smallest value you can measure was just determined by the energy available. If you had more energy, you could measure a shorter time. We don't know if there's any fundamental limit. We just know to measure a shorter time, you need more energy. Whether there's some intrinsic limit beyond that, we don't know. So that, this doesn't cast light on that deep and vexing question. Yes? Yes. 
Is this the only system that saturates the bound? No, there, <laughs> it's the only simple system. There are these ordinary quantum systems that we use to do gauge gravity duality. They are very complicated gauge theories of the kind you use to describe the strong interactions. You have to have a very large number of colors. You have to make them supersymmetric. Such a system saturates the chaos bound. But it is a, a holy mess. I mean, it, yeah. But there, there, I don't, there, there are a set of related models that also saturate where you have not just pairs of qubits, but triples of qubits. But other than this family, I don't know of a simple model that does it. Yes. Can successful theoretical studies do you expect any applications for the theory of quantum gravity and everything? Well, um, yeah, the, the question was, uh, I don't remember the exception, but uh, do you expect any applications of these quantum gravity ideas? One kind of uh, application, if you will, is this uh, bound on the strength of chaos. Motivated by quantum gravity, we were led to look for this uh, bound that nothing could be more chaotic than a black hole. Now you can go around looking at ordinary systems in the laboratory along the lines of the previous question and actually try to measure this Lyapunov exponent and make sure it doesn't exceed the bound. So it has a, a sharp experimental prediction for those measurements. So that's an example of, of the kind of thing. I should say that there's another kind of example that's a little bit, well, it's a little stranger, but I'll try to, to say it since I've started. Many people are trying to build quantum computers now. I'm sure you've read about it in the newspaper or uh, online, wherever. It's a, it's a really big thing, and, and it may well happen. But there's a public relations aspect to this. What people want to know who will be the first to build one. And the test that people have started to establish is what's called quantum supremacy. That's a very power, powerful phrase. The idea is to find some kind of problem that the little quantum computer you build can solve faster than any classical computer could. So you want to build a problem that uses quantum mechanics in a very deep way. It turns out these chaotic problems are just what the doctor ordered. So people that are building quantum supremacy tests are using models like this as a, as a um, test bed. They're saying, look, we can solve this problem with our little quantum computer with 22 qubits. You'll never be able to do it in your classical computer, as we have found out to our dismay how hard it is to study these things classically. So that may be the first application of these ideas, is to advertise it okay, for, classical com for quantum computers.